Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us this evening. My name is Alyssa, um, and I'm a member of the MBA tour. We host networking events to help connect business schools with prospective candidates. So definitely check out our website to learn more. Uh, today, I'm joined by Scott Edinburgh. He's the co-founder of Personal MBA Coach, which is an organization that's helped hundreds of applicants around the world get into top MBA, EMBA, part-time MBA and graduate programs. Um, and today he's gonna be sharing how personal MBA coach candidates have earned uh, scholarships across M M7 schools. So thank you again for joining us and I'm gonna hand it over to you, Scott. Alyssa, thank you so much. I appreciate you inviting us here tonight, this afternoon, this morning, wherever ever, everyone is. And yeah, first of all, hope everyone is staying as healthy and safe as as you can. I know the, the news is not not good news for everyone. So, you know, really hope everyone is doing doing their part, staying inside. Um, and yeah, really appreciate you, you know, logging in and, and chatting here today. So as Alyssa mentioned, we will be talking about, you know, client success stories, how our clients you know, receive a lot of scholarship dollars and, you know, people get, I'll kind of talk generally for the first minute or so as, as folks log on, a lot of people are, are logging on late. So if you are just logging on, you haven't missed anything. Um, you know, people get scholarships for a lot of different reasons and we'll kind of talk about, you know, some of them today. Also on a lot of people's minds is, you know, COVID, coronavirus, the impacts of that on applications. So I will probably talk about that to some extent as well. And there's a, a question a feature within GoToWebinar. And so feel free to type any questions. It doesn't have to be related to scholarships. It can be related to round three, round four, round one, whatever's on everyone's mind, waiving GMAT scores, online GMAT, any of that stuff. Happy to answer you know, anything and everything that's on your mind today. Um, but you know, the main part of the presentation will cover scholarships and you know how folks are earning earning scholarships, but feel free to try to derail me along the way. We'll answer some questions as we go throughout the slides, and then we'll certainly have some time at the end for Q&A. And if this is like any of the other presentations that I give, there will probably be a lot of questions, and probably a lot of questions that you know we're not uh, able to answer. And as I see the number of attendees continue to climb, hopefully we have, have enough, enough uh, maximum capacity here to hold everyone, um, we might not get to all of all the questions. So if we don't, then you know, feel free to send an email afterwards with your question if we don't get to it. My email address is scott, S-E-O-T-T, -T, at personalmbacoach.com, and I'd be more than happy to answer any questions, either that we're not able to answer today, or if something is of sensitive nature and you don't feel like me answering it uh, publicly on a, on a recorded webinar, uh, then we can certainly do that privately as well. Okay. Okay, so a little bit of background about myself. And yeah, feel free to just type questions anytime here. So my name is Scott Edinburgh, founder of Personal MBA Coach. I went to MIT for undergrad, where I studied economics and business at Sloan. I was part of MIT's undergrad uh, business program, and I was a TA for one of the MBA courses as an undergraduate. I always kind of knew I wanted the MBA path. And after school, I started working at Deloitte in consulting, also here in Boston, did mostly mergers and acquisitions work, spent three years there. Then I went to Wharton for the MBA. I picked Wharton because when I was in high school, I took a couple summers of economics classes at Wharton, really liked the curriculum, kind of nerdy to take college classes as a high schooler. It was fun to live in the dorms. Uh, and I wanted to go back for the MBA. My thought was to go into real estate development. So went there in 2008, the last recession, not the best time for real estate, but it was a great time for people to apply to school. So, you know, this is another really, really good time. Um, such a good time that I actually helped my best friend with his applications to get into the schools. He was using another firm that had a bit more of a standard process, a large team. He was paired with one of many, many consultants. I didn't really think his essays were that personalized. Long story short, we did them. He got into Harvard, helped another friend get in, another one, and the business just expanded. It was in a recession. Tons of people were applying to schools, and you know we kept getting people in. 
So you know, fast forward 13 years later to another recession, um, and you know, here we are. Um, I'm on the board of directors for the Association of International Graduate Admissions Consultants, which is a membership group of seven board members globally that do a lot with admissions directors. We have an annual conference each year with heads of admissions for all the top schools. I generally give them a presentation, talk about the results of the survey we do, and we even do this mock valuation session where we sit in the room with Adcom and uh, determine who should get accepted and, and rejected. So a bit of a behind the scenes look into the process. Um, top ranked consultant on MBA Insight, actually I have to update this slide, will be the number two ranked on uh, Poets and Quants, number one on Business Because. Uh, and I was invited to present at the GMAT conference uh, last summer. So overall our clients, 96% success rate, and we're actually we're up to over 5 million in scholarships from last year, probably closer to six, although we haven't ran the numbers uh, lately. So a little bit about what Personal MBA Coach does, and then we will get onto the topic of the, the presentation. For those of you who are not familiar with us or who have not met me in one of these uh, MBA tour events, we offer complete GMAT, GRE, executive assessment, tutoring, and uh, admissions consultancy. We have uh, some former M7 admissions directors on our team. Um, we help people everywhere from you know early planning, so if you're a few months before applying or a few years or longer before applying, we can certainly help you to get everything you need ready to go. So perfecting your extracurricular profile, developing your story, making sure that you're as strong as you uh, can possibly be. We have former M7 uh, MBA interviewers on our team as well and clients to network with at every, every top school. So I see some questions before we even get started. Really appreciate the questions. For those of you just logging in, I'm Scott Edinburgh, founder of Personal MBA Coach. We'll be talking about uh, scholarships today and some scholarship success stories, but we're happy to answer questions about anything that you have on your mind. So first one, do postgraduate grades, I need to scroll through the Technology only shows me half a line at a time. Most graduate grades in nationally accredited programs and not regionally accredited programs assist in obtaining scholarships even when getting into top schools. Um, so I would say yes, you know, in any any time you're in a school and you get good grades, that certainly helps you to get scholarships, whether it's you know an accredited, you know, the top school or not not a top school. Obviously, a better ranked school will make you look a, a little bit better. Um, will the COVID-19 situation make round one more competitive for international students since many of them might defer this year? The answer is yes, it probably will. And we can talk more about COVID-19 a little bit later on, um, but it will probably be more competitive for international students and honestly for all, all students, but definitely for international students. Uh, for those of you who haven't followed the news, you know, some folks might not be able to get visas to come to the US to school in time or to Europe or Canada. And if that's the case, um, then they'll probably end up deferring to next year. So there will be some people that will be quote, pre-accepted and that will make it more competitive. I wish my answer was was different, but that, that is the case. So that's why we're actually doing a lot of work with folks now applying in around three and four, especially uh, domestic applicants that don't have to worry about uh, visas. Okay, so on to the topic of presentation today. So, you know, these are folks that really maximize, you know, getting scholarships and had a good time telling their story, right? So uh, compelling, unique, unique stories, and we'll, we'll go over some of them. Here's the first profile, 3.4 GPA, 330 GRE. For those of you who are not familiar with the GRE, it's out of 340, uh, four years of work experience, and these years of work experience are upon matriculation. Uh, worked in consulting. This is a white female from an Ivy League institution. So what are some observations? Well, first of all, this particular person was rejected previously. That's not really an observation you could have had from the information I presented, but you know, this particular person was rejected previously. Uh, pretty common background. When I say common background, you know, consulting, white female, 330 GRE, so far there's nothing that really stands out. And average stats, average stats meaning you know, 3.4 GPA is a little, actually a little bit below average, uh, and the, the test score is a little bit above average. Okay, so that's kind of what we're 
what we're working with here. Now, here's what, what made things interesting, right? This particular person loved art. I mean, we had so many fun conversations around art and the types of things that this, per I guess not that many conversations, but we had some fun conversations around art. Uh, there are extracurriculars involved, you know, consulting for an art gallery. Uh, the post MBA goals were actually pretty interesting strategy and art consulting. Now, one thing to note about post MBA goals, they do not need to be unique. It's kind of a misunderstanding that, you know, I have to quote, have really exciting and exotic post MBA goals. You do not. They could be super boring. They can put me to sleep. That's fine. This particular person happened to connect, you know, her passion with art to the post MBA goals. But, you know, more, more importantly, um, this this art passion, you know, came about because of her personal background, you know, growing up with with a family of artists. And so what we did, we kind of dug into, you know, family history, extracurriculars, work, you know, passions. We figured out what common themes existed. Now, uh, the first thing that we do with all clients is have them fill out an initial information form. That kind of tells us about your personal background, like your hobbies, passions, challenges, struggles, whether you're working with me or one of my former admissions directors on my team who have 35 years of experience evaluating applicants. We really want to see what makes you shine. What are some things that are interesting? I kicked off a client this morning and you know we, we ended up focusing on, well, it, we're, we're, we're still kind of debating whether there's something related to art actually or education uh, keep it vague without going into more confidential details but the point is the the focus on art for this new client today was actually not something that they were initially thinking about but it was unique so you know the same thing happened for this applicant we're talking about um you know art ended up being a way to weave a nice theme throughout the essays and and the goals and this resulted in uh, Chicago Booth acceptance with 150,000 in, in scholarships. I noticed we didn't talk about big leadership or starting eight nonprofit organizations or saving Africa or anything like that. Sometimes really key specific messages help. Um, some other reasons why this person, I believe, got scholarships was they were really, really, really interested in Chicago Booth and they showed it. If you think about why a school will give you money, right? They're going to give you money if they think that you are going to be additive to the class. So what does that mean? You're better than most people. You're going to bring something to the community that other people on average do not bring. Yes, that can be an 800 GMAT score. Yes, it can be a 4.0 GPA or both. Or you can just bring other things, other specific passions, hobbies, they want to see you really contributing to the campus and not going inside and you know watching Netflix all day. Okay, so second success story. Here is someone, a great guy, and actually he just sent his brother to us recently. Um, so eight out of ten GPA, seven sixty GMAT, right? So pretty pretty strong stats. Uh, three years of work experience, investment banking, uh, Hispanic male from a non-target. Uh, international school. So, so here, um, you know, what do we have here? Okay, so we have great stats, of course. Um, we have limited experience and a common background. Working in investment banking with with three years, there's a little bit on on the lower side. So that's kind of what we what we had working with us now. Um, there were some really interesting extracurriculars, okay? So we were organizing a, a summer camp for you know, disabled children, focusing on music. Um, the goals involved returning to a family business. And then we had some passion for trains and transportation. You know, so this is a little bit unique, a uh, bit different from the average person, let's say. And we really focused on some of these some of these items. I don't know where this face painting picture comes from, but in any case, uh, by emphasizing you know these extracurriculars, we were able to figure out a way to talk about this person 
that differentiated them besides you know just the the work experience you know because the work experience wasn't that exciting investment banking there wasn't really anything that this person did that was strong work very very strong work actually but nothing that you know would amazingly kind of get them in over over someone else uh, and we highlighted very specific leadership examples and a willingness to go against the grain now this became important because of certain situations that happen and you know, this person's willingness to challenge other people and you know talk about what he really wanted to do that was let's say not commonly done at work especially being a junior junior employee and so that ended up allowing him to show a lot of leadership ability and uh, this person will be going to mit sloan um, next year so so that's a big accomplishment i'm gonna have a scholarship numbers here there there were there were decent scholarships as well so let's see i have one question here so far um okay so we already answered that question we answered this question will COVID be more competitive yes working in it sector with an experience of three years from Polkett, what are the challenge chances of getting into a top mba program well you know i need to know a little bit more information to be honest uh, if you're able to send me your resume and some stats I'm more than happy to review it three years of experience it really just depends uh, you know this person got in with three years of experience three is a little bit low within it but I, I kind of need to know a little bit more about your background like the stats the school you know all that uh another question scholarships are based on first come first serve basics basically how some questions okay how and when to apply for scholarships so actually most if this is a really good clarifying question and perhaps the rest of you are curious about this as well uh, most scholarships are and thanks everyone for joining for those just logging in i'm scott edinburgh founder of personal mba coach we're talking about candidate success stories and uh, for those who got scholarships and we can also talk about COVID and the impact on applications as well so most scholarships, I would venture to say 99% of money that our clients get, and you know, we got like five, six million probably last year, comes from the schools directly without you needing to do anything. So there's no need to write a scholarship essay. There's no need to apply for scholarship for most, most of them. That does exist to some extent. It's really just writing very, very strong applications and having a high test score. So the better the app, more likely you are to get money and our clients get many times uh, more scholarships than the average usually people are making money working with us you know they're paying us 10 15 thousand and they're making many times more than that in scholarships more than they would have otherwise gotten on their own okay so here's a third success story um so this particular person this is an interesting success story right because you might look at it and say okay you know is this a joke 4.0 335 GRE, you know, what's what's the point of this? Well, the point is to show what you can do if you do a really good job in the application. There are folks with 4.0s and 790 GMATs that get rejected from some schools and don't get scholarships. Um, and we see some of that as well. Uh, but if you do a really good job of sort of tying things together, you can do extremely well. So this particular person, again, three years of experience in banking, so a little bit on, on the lower side. Uh, a white female who studied at an Ivy League uh, Ivy League school. So what did we do? You know, here we we talked about how golf, you know, kind of helped her think about the importance of mental strength leading to a passion for psychology and tutoring. Now, if you take a step back, you might think golf, psychology, tutoring you know how does that really work well it was a bit of a story to, to put together we also ended up connecting this uh, to her goal on organizational consulting and then combine seemingly different ideas into one story about caring about people uh, and we also highlighted some leadership stories here so this was this was kind of fun because at the beginning of the engagement you know, neither of us thought this was going to be our approach, uh, but it ended up working out, you know, really, really well. Um, so, uh, you know, we'll focus on. So 
by by doing so, um, you know, talking about a lot of the the leadership, right, allowed us to overcome concerns about the limited career experience. Sometimes people come to us and they say, "How many years is too few and too many?" I'll tell you now, we have four people doing round three and round four who are going to start next year with two years of experience. And I'm very confident they'll all get in. A few reasons why. One, it's easier to apply now than it will be in round one, uh, especially for some of these schools. Two, we're able to showcase their skills in a way that really demonstrates that they're doing things that are you know, outside of the normal and will allow them to shine You know, versus the average person who, you know, maybe is talking about like what they do at work without really focusing on, you know, key leadership accomplishments, and that's really important. So, like for this applicant, you know, we talked about different working groups that they set up. You know, certain employee engagement activities. There are a lot of ways to showcase, you know, success even if you don't have uh, a ton of experience. Now, the result. This particular person. So we applied to six schools together. Usually applicants apply to between like five and seven schools. Um, so you apply to six schools, got into all of them actually, which is a crazy story, and earned over $550,000 in scholarships across them and included Harvard, Stanford, Wharton, you know, Booth, um, all, all six schools. And, you know, it was not just because of the stats. Plenty of people have 4.0 and get rejected and, you know, don't get the, the scholarship. So, of course, the numbers helped. But the ability to really tie this story together, especially coming from an industry that doesn't really have the stronger stories I'd say, you know, we were able to do uh, quite well. And then she's already sent one of her friends to us, which is kind of exciting. Okay, uh, let's see, any questions so far on these stories or applications in general? Okay, there's a question. How much of a disadvantage would one would one be like would so would one have uh, so as an editor I always look at the grammar how much of a disadvantage would one have if they were to apply with one or two years of work experience is it better to wait than risk the chances yeah really really good question so if you only have one year meaning you just graduated in 2019 that's really low I mean we have some people that start with one. One of my good friends, actually, uh, from Wharton, she started just one year af after school. She did really well. Really smart, really smart woman, too. So it, it happens. I mean, people get in after one year. If you're applying now in the COVID era, you know, this extended around four, around three, et cetera, I think you can make it work, especially if you're stature strong. Schools need people, right? They're having international applicants that might not be able to get visas in time, they might not be able to come on campus, and they need to fill the spots. So, you know, as you probably heard in many different locations, schools need good people. So if you're good and you're young, I think it's a great time to apply. Now, that said, if you get a little bit more experience, it could increase your chances of getting in. So I think if I were you, I would apply if, you know, you're mentally ready for it to perhaps not work out. Uh, but I'd love to review your profile if you're you know, interested in potentially exploring things further. Send over some notes and then I can give you more specific feedback. Okay, success story four. So he was an Indian female trader who had three years of, for whatever reason, we have low experience here, three years of experience, 730 GMAT, um, and went to an international store. I didn't you know, list the details of the school. It, it, it was, it was, you know, it wasn't the best school out there, I would say. So what do we do here? Well, first of all, what are some challenges, right? For her, she really wanted scholarships. I mean, that was, that was important. She said, look, Scott, I'm you know, happy to pay your fees, but I need you to make money for us. Um, so we really want to earn a scholarship with average test scores. Now, as an Indian trader with a 730, it's not an amazing score. It's not an amazing score. It's an okay score. It's the average but it really doesn't overcome the average. Uh, also, we had light extracurriculars. The extracurriculars are important. You know, some people ask me sometimes to like weigh the 
the importance of extracurriculars and rate them and give a percentage and things like that. That's kind of tricky to do, um, but it definitely is an important part of the process because all things being equal, if someone is very involved and someone else is not, I'd rather take the involved person so that you come on campus and you seem like you're going to be a strong contributor. That said, if you don't do things now and you did things in college, you know, that's understandable. So, um, and for those just joining, Scott with Personal MBA Coach, we're talking about candidate success stories. We've received lots of scholarships and happy to answer questions about anything as well, including the coronavirus round and, you know, impact on admissions and that, that sort of thing. Okay, so these were these were the challenges. And these are some more details, right? So here we we actually talked about seeing gaps in healthcare with a particular particular relative's uh, treatment and combined it with her passion for giving back. Uh, you know, we had some some STEM consulting experience. Uh, we combined that with you know analytical skills from finance to solve India's healthcare issue or issues, let's say. Now the, the short-term goal involved healthcare consulting and long-term was further work in healthcare in India. You know, for here, we made a common goal make sense for her, right? Despite being a career switcher. So if you talk about healthcare consulting or just consulting in general, a lot of people can write about consulting. One question I get from applicants is, you know, can I talk about management consulting? It's not that exciting. You know, how will that differentiate me, right? So you don't need to differentiate yourself by goals, as I mentioned before, but you really do want to think about how it makes sense for you as an applicant. Um, in this case, we also showed, you know, leadership despite being underrepresented in trading. So as an Indian female in trading, let's just say she wasn't at the top of her class. Um, there were people above her that maybe didn't want her to you know, rise as much and there were some issues at, at the workforce. And we really showed leadership, right? We started new initiatives, we recruited other folks, you know, that kind of looked and felt like her, which was very, very exciting. Um, and it ended up working out quite well at the end of the day. So let's see, I think we talked about some of this already. Willingness to lead despite you know, being underrepresented in her in her industry and uh, ended up going to or you know we'll go to chicago booth uh, but was accepted at chicago booth and michigan ross with one hundred sixty thousand dollars in scholarships that's really exciting because i know this applicant's going to go back home and do really really great things back in india and i'm excited to, to watch that happen okay let's see any other questions so far Why is your voice so annoying? No, I'm just kidding. Okay. Um, okay, most schools also have financial need scholarships on top of the merit-based ones. Can you detail better what does that mean and what would a profile that fits, what is a profile that fits financial need? Yeah, really good question, right? So we, we only work with merit-based uh, because there's nothing for an admissions consultant to do around the financial component, but let's just say that every school is different, right? So there's not a, there's not like a salary cutoff that says if you make more than X, you don't get money. Every school is different. You know, some schools give more than others. Um, they're looking at your willingness, your ability to pay, right? So they would be looking at your income. They would be looking at savings. Um, it's really it's really those two those two components, and then they try to make it you know, fair, so that if you really want to go and you don't have the ability to pay, um, you know, those like need-based uh, scholarships can, can certainly help you. But unfortunately, there's not one blanket answer, just because every school handles this a little bit separately. Sometimes it's, it's, it's a loan, you know, sometimes it's a grant, you know, you, it's a loan that you can write off later on. I mean, everyone handles this a little, a little bit differently. But let's just say if you make a lot less money than your friends, you know, more likely for you to get some assistance. If you're in private equity, investment banking, you know, consulting, I would say uh, don't hold your breath. Okay. How negotiable are merit? Uh oh, this is, 
this is being recorded. You're going to get me in trouble with my friends and admissions. How negotiable are merit-based scholarships? Uh, if you haven't been given any merit-based scholarship, is it possible to nudge the admissions office toward one? And then we have some info about this person. I won't repeat it out loud in case it's somewhat confidential, but let's see, I'll read it. Um, yeah, so uh, the answer is yes. Scholarships are negotiable. Um, even in your case, and I won't mention your case here, um, it, is, it is possible to negotiate. Um, you just have to ask politely and see what they have available. At this point in the year, there's not as much money, but if some people don't end up going, the money will come back. Now, to really negotiate for scholarships, um, it's I, I don't even really want to use the word negotiate. Ask for more money. You have to give them something, right? So if if school X is the only school that you got into and you got let's say 20,000 from them and you want 80,000, you can certainly ask, you know, but you're not going to go anywhere else. So your BATNA, you know, best alternative to negotiated agreement. I did a lot of negotiation research when I was in college um, at MIT. You don't have a BATNA, right? But if you apply to, you know, six or seven schools and you got money from a couple of them and then your top choice school accepted you, they didn't give money, well, now you have something to, you know, to kind of help you ask for more money. And that's really what you want. That's really what you want. So things are negotiable. It just depends on the budget and how much they want you. But you ask once, you ask very politely. And if you hear no, you don't ask again. And some schools don't negotiate. Like Wharton doesn't negotiate. Every year I have clients, I have a few clients I love this year. And, you know, they asked about negotiating and you know, I said, no, don't do it. And, um, you know, anyway. Um, okay, perfect. Oh, and thanks for coming in. I just saw who asked that question. So thanks for coming in. And thanks for the referral as well earlier today. Um, okay, so I am already accepted to a European program. And with the current situation, my financials were significantly impacted. Yeah, I'm sorry. It's tough for a lot of people out there. Hang in there, we'll get better, we'll get better. We lived through the last one. Um, so I'm looking for scholarship sources besides a school scholarship. Do you know any external sources of scholarships? Yes, yes, send me an email. I can definitely send you some other, other uh, sources. There are a lot of different sources of scholarships out there. Okay, so move on to the next success story. Success story five, okay. So this is CETOS, I'll just give you the name. CETOS Nepal, he'll be on our website. We're updating the website. There'll be some videos and pictures of him. Uh, 3.4 GPA, 750 GMAT, five years of work experience. Worked in automotive and uh, was a male from, from Nepal. So what do we have here? Differentiating a male engineer with an average GPA, right? That's the challenge. 3.4 GPA, not amazing, really nice guy, but GPA was you know only average. So what are we doing? Well, first of all, loved cars. I don't know what picture this is of the car. Oh, cool. I don't make my own slides. Anyway, this is a really cool car. Um, so extracurriculars, self-driving cars, debate and volunteer work um, in the community. You know, for, for CTOS, we really honed in on a story and doubled down on cars. Now, here's an applicant that we've been working with for years. Um, and he actually helped us out at the MBA tour in Boston. So some of you might have met him. Um, we started early planning and early planning is a package that we have to allow people to, or rather to help people improve their profiles between now and when they're applying to schools. So we figure out what your story should be. I tell you what things we like, what we don't like, exactly how to perfect it, certain activities to get involved in, certain things not to do. Citos and I started early planning. I met him at the MBA tour uh, a few years ago, and we did a lot of a lot of fun work together. Um, we just doubled down on the story of cars, right? So he worked at a self or works at a self-driving car company. Everything that he does, you know, focuses on on cars, um, and we really needed to just tell a strong story. Uh, now, what were his goals? So goals were 
project management in the mobility industry. I don't know if we were to call it industry mobility, but in any case, uh, we wanted to move from engineering to a PM role. That's a common thing to do, um, but it, it worked out really well. And then, you know, just generally kind of had personal passions around cars and uh, transportation. So we really worked on the extracurricular profile early on. You know, we had some work in like local organizations, but then I helped him to figure out what he wanted to do in the organization, certain things we wanted to stop. I helped him to determine some leadership things so that he could have so that we really, you know, once we filled out the applications, we had a few bullets per organization, per organization and we were able to hone in on, you know, things that made him look as impressive um, as, as it could be. And here we, we had unique goals. Now, remember, I said earlier, you don't have to have unique goals. So CTOs did have interesting goals, and I think that was really helpful for him. But what that meant is he had to be the expert of his own domain. One thing that you'll see if you go through this process um, in the interview is some schools really try to catch you off guard. Like, you know, Harvard asks very, very specific questions about your background, your goals. If you talk about wanting to go into clean tech, be ready to talk about clean tech. I mean, what in, what companies you like, what companies you don't like, who you admire, who you don't admire, challenges in the space, what would your role be? What would the company do with recessionary period? What about when we come out of recession? You have to be able to answer a lot of, a lot of questions. Okay, so back to CTOS. Uh, so CTOS got into Wharton and Kellogg. We didn't have the scholarship dollars here, but uh, we got a lot of scholarship dollars as well. I forget the exact number, um, but we got quite quite a bit of money. And I believe he will be going uh, to Wharton. Okay, some other questions. How do you suggest people come up with their unique stories? Meaning, how do we take what makes us unique and put that into a narrative for the MBA? Well, it's a, it's a good question. I mean, I don't know when you when you joined, but <clears throat> we talked early on that at least a personal MBA coach, we start with a brainstorming session at the beginning of all uh, engagements where you know we'll ask you things about your passions, challenges, hobbies, struggles, that sort of thing. And the idea is to really think about the key points about you that we wanna highlight. What goes in the essays? What goes in the resume? What do we want the recommenders to focus on? You know, it's not a completely exhaustive exercise. You know, we don't spend hours just kind of thinking about your life, but we do spend some time to consider like, what do I care about? You know, what am I actually telling folks about me? Why do I want to go to school? Like, what are, what are my goals? And then we go back and forth and figure out what's unique. So I think for you, you know, if you're doing it, well, if you're doing it alone, come to us because we'll help you. And our clients get more scholarship dollars than anyone else and any other firm out there. But if you are doing it on your own, make a list of a few things that are important to you and then ask yourself whether you care or whether anyone else cares. Maybe start with like seven or eight things that, you know, ask Scott, like seven or eight things that make Scott interesting um, and that he's really passionate about. So if one of my things is Dave Matthews Band and listening to, you know, music, I'll probably delete that one pretty early, right? There's nothing about that that really is exciting or that anyone will, you know, truthfully care too much about. But then as you go, you know, through the items, some of them might be interesting and then you can think about, okay, so now what have I done with this particular topic? Okay. Um, can you also help in the application for master's, not MBA programs at Ivy Leagues? Yes, yes, definitely. So we do um, all, all graduate programs. So master's in management, you know, public policy, government, MFIN, all master's programs can absolutely help. Um, yeah, so Carolina, feel free to uh, to reach out if you want to learn more about that. Okay, thanks for sharing the examples of candidates' extracurricular activities. How important is the extracurricular to the application in a whole? So I'll actually wait on that. I'll, I'll answer that question in a minute. Um, let me just go to here. So right now, uh, you, this is kind of a sample of what schools people have gotten into. Our clients go to all the top schools. Um, you know, we have a 96% success rate, any school that you'd want to go to. We have tons of folks there. And what's fun about what we do is, you know, once, once you get in, you have a nice family. So like we have, we have large meetups at, you know, Wharton and Booth and Kellogg, MIT each year, 
where, you know, 20, 30 or so, you know, former clients, you know, meet up and, and kind of connect. And when I'm in certain cities, we have events, although no one's really traveling that much these days. But once we do get to travel, I'll be having events in some of these places. So what do we do with the process at Personal Media Coach? You know, we, we start with tutoring. A lot of folks use our tutors. We have the best tutors in the industry, in-house software to guide through the process with modules, sample questions, explanations for all, all the questions. Um, our folks are raising their scores on average of 90 points. And, you know, some people are going 620 to 750, right? So some really, really big jumps. You know, brainstorming, as we talked about, and we do story development. We help with school selection based on personality, fit, chance of getting in, things like that. Obviously, resume editing, have an expert resume editor on our team that helps with the essay. Uh, resume editing, we'll send you sample essays so you can see what success looks like from people who have gotten in in the past. And then most of what we're doing is essay editing. We have in-house software that we use to guide through the sessions with modules, um, you know, timelines, calendars, and we help you to think through the whole process. And at the end, once you get to interviews, former interviewers from most of the top schools to help with interview prep. And you can work with myself. We have some former admissions directors on our team as well. Um, but that's a little bit about the process. They're very, very high level. So we can obviously go into more detail. If you want to think about what you should be doing and you know, how to kind of get started, we have a kickstart guide. It's personalmbacoach.com slash kickstart sign up. Or you can just go to personalmbacoach.com scroll down and you'll see the kickstart guide as well as a bunch of other guides as well um, any other questions or thoughts that you have that we're not able to address today and we're still answering questions now feel free to send me an email scott s-c-o-t-t at personal mba coach.com and we'll be more than happy to uh, answer so if you haven't asked questions so far would love for you to start typing some questions and i would love to uh to answer them and I was just starting to answer one before I interrupted myself. Okay, so how important are extracurriculars to the application as a whole? I work in an industry with long hours and do not have strong extracurriculars. Should I devote more time now and focus more on other aspects of the application? Really, really good question. Well, first of all, I would have to look at your profile because I was talking with one of the ad comms on my team and there was an applicant that I felt like needed more. And this admissions director said, no, you know what? I think they're fine because they're doing some leadership at work. They have done really, really, really good things in college and they're working 120 hours a week in private equity. So I don't care. You know, it, it depends on what I'm looking at overall. If you were a strong contributor in college, and schools might assume that by the time you get on campus, you'll also be a strong contributor. That said, it's April. There's time. There's a lot that you can do between now and when you submit. So all things being equal, if you do more things now and some than someone else, you can still differentiate yourself and potentially beat, beat others. So I would say to you know think about getting involved in some leadership. But again, it's this is not again, I think this is the first time I mentioned this, but it's quality over quantity. And it's really story over quality. So we don't just want, you know, as many different things that you can do, as much leadership um, as you can. You want something that's going to make sense for you and help to tell your story. Okay. So I hear it's best to apply round one or two. So I plan to apply this fall to Wharton saying it'll be more competitive with international applicants. Um, I believe it will. Yes, I, I, I believe it will be. This will probably be a hard year to apply to schools. Now, round one is still definitely a good round to apply in. Wharton's round three is over, so we can't do that anymore. We can certainly do round three for other schools now, and a lot of people are doing round three, but it will probably be more competitive in the fall. Now, how much more competitive? It really just depends. No one knows. But you know, if a lot of folks are not able to get their visas to come, then they'll get automatically deferred to next year. And that's just a certain number of people that already have acceptances. So I think it will make it a little bit more competitive for others. And schools are not really able to you know, increase their class size that much, a little bit maybe, but not, not really. Um, okay, 
Let's see, any other questions? How would you manage an intended career switch during the application? For instance, coming from a real estate background. Oh, great, yeah, we work with a lot of folks in real estate and you know, place them extremely well. I, I studied real estate at Wharton, so definitely come to the right place. Um, and you wanna go into consulting you know, without um, previous work experience. Well, if you don't have experience in the thing that you wanna do, then you have to think about how you can convince someone. So in some ways, it's not necessarily rocket science. We just think about some of the core components. So let's say you're in an interview for consulting. What would you tell them? Like, why are you good for that role? Think about those reasons. And then those are the things that you wanna be focusing on as far as the like why MBA and why, you know, the, the particular goals. So I would think about whether it's like communication or you know, analytical skills, right? What are, what are components of that role that you wanna do? And how does that compare to what you're, you're doing now? That's at least how I would start. Um, how much weight does your GPA hold in the application process? I have a 3.3 GPA about to graduate in May, looking to start my MBA program fall 2023. So you should definitely sign up for our early planning package. We can help you to overcome this. The GPA is pretty important. Uh, I hate to say it, it is an important part of the process, but you know the good news is you can overcome it by um, having a good test score and having some other extra graduate level courses that you take on the side as well. So pretty important, but we get a lot of people in with, with low GPAs. That said, you know, you can't really have a low GPA and a low test score and then try to get into a top school. That's quite a bit more challenging. Um, okay, what is a good GMAT score to be an attractive MBA candidate? You know, I need more information, right? Because it depends on what's your GPA, right? As, as we just mentioned, it depends what school you're gonna be applying to, you know, what's your job experience, what are the extracurriculars? So that's, that's, a, that, that's a tough one. I would need a little bit more information. But you can look at the ranges that schools um, you know, give on, on their websites, and that certainly could be a good indication for you to think about what, you know, what GMAT score you might uh, need to get. Um, do any people you work with get full rides? Oh yes, a lot of people get full rides. So, you know, that, that, that woman that, that I mentioned that had, you know, 550,000 in scholarships, uh, she got a number, of, a number of full rides. So yes, people are certainly getting full rides. Not only that, uh, some people are getting uh, stipends. So we've had, you know, people get, you know, upwards of $20,000 uh, cash each year on top of a full ride just to, just to study at school. So full rides are definitely happening. You need a strong application, um, but you can certainly get there. Okay, let's see what else. Should one focus on scholarships from the respective schools they are applying to, a research or fellowships, external? Yeah, no, just focus on the school. This outside stuff, I think, is a big waste of time. A lot of people ask about this, you know, all the different sources of scholarships and what can you do and look at this, look at that. It's, you know, it's kind of like boiling the ocean. There is money out there. But money that you'll get from a school will be so much more worth it than all these other things that you might find all combined. Just focus on writing a really good application. Now, there are other avenues, like there's, you know, through apply through Forte and there's consortium and MLT. Like, so there are other, you know, other places that you can apply with if you fall into one of those categories. But at the end of the day, the school is the one giving the money anyway. So you know, through consortium or Forte, it doesn't matter. The school is the one that's actually giving you funds. Um, and that's where the vast, vast majority of the money comes from. So these external sources don't even look at anything until you get accepted to a school. Okay. Um, hi, could you please comment on the different patterns preferences among M7 schools and giving out their scholarship? For example, do some schools tend to give out a few hundred K versus many 5K, 50K? Yeah, really interesting. So. You know, Wharton this year was was kind of in round one. We saw either people get nothing or get fifty thousand, eighty thousand. 
Round two, we had a wide range. We had people get as low as six thousand dollars. Six thousand, you know, we had eight thousand, we had ten thousand, and then we had a hundred thousand, we had eighty thousand, we had fifty thousand. So it's really interesting what Wharton did in, in round two this year. Uh, you know, Harvard and Stanford don't really give merit money. Um, I say don't really because technically there's some, but not for most people. And it's you know, if you're from the Midwest, you can get like one of three. Uh, <clears throat> fellowships to, to Stanford, but you know, for the most part, they don't give money. Wharton does give some money um, to, to some people. Uh, Kellogg and Booth are probably the the best schools if you're looking at an M7 school that gives scholarships. Our clients get tons of money to Kellogg, you know, hundred thousand, fifty thousand. People are getting a lot of money to, to those two those two schools. MIT has a little bit of a, of a tighter budget as far as scholarships. Uh, Columbia Columbia is pretty good. And yes, you can apply early decision and get money to Columbia. You can apply early decision and get money to Columbia. It happens every year. We send tons of people to early decision. And I mean, we have people that, that got full rides. In fact, one of our GMAT tutors went to Columbia, um, uh, Bob, and got a 790 on the GMAT, got a full ride, and is an amazing tutor. Um, and, uh, you know, applied early decision. So he had to commit, but they gave him a full ride. And he was the second person to get accepted that year. Okay, uh, let's see, similar to financial need, are there scholarships targeting bringing students of specific demographics onto campus? Yes, there are, there are. Um, so there, first of all, schools will award you something based on your background, potentially. And then there are others like Ramba fellowships and things like that. So yes, there are um, certain fellowships based on your specific demographic background. Mm -hmm. Okay. A lot of the success stories you propose have quite high scholarships. Do most of these, these schools offer that many for rides, or are these numbers combined scholarships in multiple schools? So uh, often these are these are combined scholarships. Yeah, it's a, it's a great clarifying question. Many of them are combined scholarships, um, where you know. You might not get 150,000. You might get, you know, 70 and 80 or something. So definitely saw some some combined scholarships here. But people are also getting getting full rides. So it really just depends. And just today we had, you know, we had two people get an additional 50,000 offered from Yale. Yale came back and said, you know, you had 50. Here's another 50 more. Um, Oh, finds magic. Okay. Well, thanks. Maybe if, if we chat a little later, we'll, we'll mention your case. But um, yeah, so the question earlier was around uh, Columbia Business School early decision uh, negotiation for, for scholarship from a client that I worked with. And thanks for logging back onto the webinar again. Uh, okay. Are there separate applications for merit based scholarships or are you considered through your admission application? Yeah. So, um, it's really just through the application. Some schools have some essay that you have to write here and there, but it's not common. Most schools just give you scholarships based on the strength of your application. So if you write really good essays, you know, as our clients do, you're more likely to get scholarships. So all you have to do is just write a really, really good application and get a high, high test score. And the high test score is not required, but it certainly helps. Okay. Um, you think I have a shot at Schulich, Rotman, Ivy? Um, so I would need a little bit more information from you. Um, so uh, Atif, if you want to just you know just send me some more details offline. When is the best time to apply for study abroad scholarships? That's a good question. I think uh, I think anytime, honestly. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure that, I mean, sooner, sooner the better, but I'm not sure that there's a specific time. Um, okay, now I think I got your information. Uh, two seven, Thomas Osh from New York, domestic student. Haven't written GMAT yet. Yeah, so send me send me your full resume and happy to go into a little bit more, more detail because that way I can have everything from you. Um, and I think that would be more helpful. So feel free to just send over your resume. What's the lowest GMAT score that a solid application could overcome? 
Well, you know, it depends on the year. I mean, this year, you know, we had six seventies get into M7 schools, you know, had a couple six seventies get into Columbia. It really just depends. It also depends on the year. You know, this past year was a bit easier than it will be next year. So, you know, Columbia has an average 730 GMAT. I mean, we had 670s get in, you know, 690s going to boot, 680s. So it definitely happens. Uh, ideally, you're getting above average, but then, of course, it depends on how everything is playing uh, altogether. Okay. Um, if I have experience in corporate development, focused in M&A, my background looks similar to an IB applicant. Well, I would say no, no. I mean, there are some similarities, but, you know, I did, I did M&A consulting and, you know, we worked with a lot of folks with these backgrounds. Investment banking is a little bit different. So if you're internal in the company, I would say that uh, you're not directly competing with investment bankers. A lot of you are sticking on. I see the attending number, so thanks for staying here. How long do typical MBA students pay back student loans? Is it worth the debt? Well, this depends on the person, right? Are you going for a job that has a high-paying salary right after school? Or are you going for a nonprofit? You know, but in nonprofits, often schools will erase the debt. Um, I would say it's worth it. You know, invest in the future, right? I'm sitting here. I'm an old guy, you know, wife and kid, you know, house in the suburbs, everything. If I look back in time and think, was it worth a couple hundred thousand? Certainly, certainly. In a heartbeat, I would, I would do this again. I'd pay double if that's what it required. You know, focus on the next 20 years, 30 years. Right away, it seems like it's a lot of money, and it absolutely is a lot of money. But over the long run, even if you make $10,000 more per year in salary, you know, that pays off what, 15 years or so, 20 years, depending on how much you pay for school. And that's only 10 more. I mean, you're probably gonna do a lot better than that. So I would say it's worth it in the long run. You don't want someone else to take a job because they have an MBA and you don't. Um, 700 GMAT or 321 GRE, which is better to submit? I'd say they're pretty similar. I'd say that sounds like a pretty similar score. So there's probably not gonna be much of a difference, honestly. Um, Cost of our service. Yeah, so our services are priced based on the number of schools that you apply to, and all the rates are on our website. So feel free to just go to www.personalmbacoach.com and you can check out the services. The most common package we do is five schools, which is 12,300 US dollars. And our tutoring is around $5,000 for 20 hours of tutoring. But feel free to go on the website. Will you get a recording of this event? Yeah, if you send an email, we can send a recording. I think we might be sending a recording to everyone, actually. Um, so if you're on our, our, our list, just from logging in, you should, you should be able to get a recording of this. How far in advance of applying would you recommend people beginning to work with the counselor? And that was a great time. Honestly, we're, you know, we're, we're working with a lot of people now. We started in January. Um, if you're applying in the fall, this is a great time to get started. You wanna work early. You know, some people start late and you just don't want anything to rush, right? Pricing is the same. Our pricing actually goes up as time goes on. So our rates will probably increase soon. Sign up sooner than later. Um, and that way you can get the best application possible. Uh, sorry if you talked about this in the first five minutes of the webinar. No need to apologize. That's okay. Um, is the ROI of the full-time MBA diminished by the recession and or potential for the first semester or two being remote? So we didn't actually talk about that. It's a really good question. I would say absolutely not. I think if anything, the ROI is higher, right? If you're entering into a recession, your job's probably not gonna be as good. Your raise is not gonna be as strong. Bonus isn't gonna be as good. You might get fired. I mean, great time to get an MBA. You know how many people we have working with us that are you know, not doing well at work or feel like they might not do well? And we, this is only the tip of the iceberg. So I know a lot of you are in professional jobs probably and still have your jobs and salaries and everything. Things have not trickled down. You know, I'm no economist, but this is just the tip of the iceberg. So, you know, I, I think that the ROI is even better. In a recession, applications go up all the time. So you'll see more people applying. I think in terms of being remote, you know, that won't impact you um, if you're applying now, if you're applying to start in a year from now. Now, 
if you're going for the round three applications, let's talk about that. Because then it's really just a balance of, do you apply and try to squeak in to a better school and potentially have to study online or not? Or do you want to wait until next year? And we don't know whether things will be online. It's looking like they might, you know, it's looking like they might. I don't want to say we don't know because it feels like they might be, but but we don't know. You know, it's possible things get delayed. Um, I was talking to someone earlier today who was thinking of Columbia. I said, apply to J-term. Apply to their January term. We start in January because you might have to start in January anyway. Um, but at the end of the day, the biggest value of the degree is the degree. Second biggest value is the network. You'll still have the network. Maybe third or fourth becomes social. So, you know, things might get impacted to some extent. But I think you'll still have a lot out of the program. And most programs are two years long. You know, so if a little bit ends up being remote or slower, you have to be six feet from the next person, you know, that's fine. It's not fine, but I don't think it'll diminish the experience as much. Um, repeat, yes, email address, scott, S-C-O-T-T, -T, at personalmbacoach.com, and I just um, flipped back to that, to that slide. So feel free to go there. Yeah, look, I mean, for those of you starting in the fall, I, I wish I had better things to say. You know, it's not perfect. Um, I think at the end of the day, though, if I look at starting one year sooner, you know, versus waiting, I would I would still go sooner because then you have the whole rest of your life to be working at a better job and, you know, advancing yourself. Plus, you're not socializing with anyone else these days anyway. So, hold on, let me person who wanted my email just left. So I'm just capturing some of that. Okay. Okay, so let's see, other questions. Um, we have a lot of questions here. I'll keep answering them. So what's, your, what's, what's my take on slightly below average GPAs and GMAT scores? Yeah, it's a really good question, right? We probably should have shown lower lower stats. Although we had, you know, we had 3.3 .3 GPA, 3.4 GPA. People get in with low grades. When I first got into the business, I was surprised because you know, I always thought, oh, you need to do so well. And you know, my father's a doctor, mother's a lawyer. And I went to MIT and I'm like, oh, yeah, study hard, do well. And that's how you get into school. And people get in with low grades. We had you know, 2.9 get into Harvard. We had a 3.0. Actually, the, I, I probably could have used him for a profile. So we had an applicant with 3.0 GPA um, who had 750 GMAT and uh, Teach for America, got into Columbia with a full ride. Full ride, paid nothing for school, 3.0 GPA. Things happen, you just have to impress them in, in some way, right? Now, if you had a 3.0 GPA and you know 670 GMAT, you're not getting a full ride. Um, but you can have low stats as long as you're really impressive and you can actually still get in. I would just focus, if you have a low GPA, I you know sign up for tutoring plus, let's get you a high GMAT score. Okay, um, are merit-based scholarships available for part-time applications or are these success stories for full-time MBA students? Uh, so, you know, both full and part-time, there's a little bit more money for full-time. Uh, there's probably a lot more money for full-time, actually. So part-time uh, applications, part-time students tend to not get as much merit money, but they definitely still get money. Should secure a scholarship be mentioned and resume under achievement? Eh, yeah, I don't know. I don't think anyone really cares that much. Do you provide service only for essays and interview? So we do have, um, Jean-Paul, we do have interview interview uh, sessions, a $600 for one hour mock interview with a former interviewer. Uh, but but for essays, no, no. We, we work through comprehensive packages. This process uh, entails a lot. You know, there's a lot that goes into it. We take a certain number of folks. We have a lot of interest. So we focus on, you know, people that are really committed to investing in, in the whole process. So signing up, doing a package, you know, doing five schools, something like that. Uh, we don't just do like a few edits here and there of, of the essays. There are other places that do that, that need to sell work, um, but we, we do not, unfortunately. Is it okay to include undergrad extracurriculars? Yes, for sure. You know, um, if you did things in undergrad, that means you'll probably do good things when you're in business school. So it's absolutely, absolutely okay, okay to include, for sure. 
Oh, and thanks for logging on. Yeah. Great to see you, Sharon. Okay. How would you help on recommendation letter part? Yeah, great question. So we really didn't talk about recommendations. Um, recommender asks you to write the letter. Here's free advice. Do not write the letter. Do not even write five words of the letter. Don't dream about writing a letter. Don't entertain the option at all. It will hurt you. People are getting rejected for writing letters. It's not something people talk about, but people are getting rejected and it's happening more and more every year. Don't do it. The way that we help is we have a recommendation one pager, which is basically a cheat sheet guide that you know you, you fill out, we do an edit of and pass it to your recommender so that we can help them to think through what are the key points that they wanna highlight in their letter. Uh, they draft a letter, we can even review it and give one round of comments to help them improve it. So that's, that's what, what we do. We can also help you to select the right recommender, but the recommender has to write the letter on their own. If they're not able to do it on their own, then you need to have another recommender write it. Uh, you definitely don't want to write anything that will uh, that will put yourself uh, in risk. At risk. Okay. Um, services sound amazing. Sign me up. How do I sign up for services? Great. Well, Diana, thank you for the uh, for the exciting exciting reaction. So feel free to uh, jump on the website uh, personalmbacoach.com and you can fill out an inquiry, and then we can follow up with you to schedule a consultation. Of course, that goes for anyone else who's here too. Which score would be better to submit? 700 GMAT, weaker quantity through. Okay. Yeah, sorry. I, I guess there were a lot of questions and I was backed up answering them. So I don't know how many more questions we have then because that question was from a while ago. Recommendation letters, do you recommend to receive from a supervisor higher up, hierarchy in the firm who knows me okay, or a direct supervisor who knows me better? Direct supervisor who knows you better. Recommenders, you really want someone who can write a lot of specific details about you. You know, this is not a situation where the title really matters at all. You know, you just want someone who knows you, who loves you, and will write really, really good things about you. So that's absolutely who you want to you want to ask. And thanks for staying. I know the questions got backed up because there are a lot of you in this webinar. So thanks for waiting for the answers. Um, how might schools proceed high GPAs from non-traditional undergrad majors, social sciences, liberal arts? Yeah, so look, I mean, to be honest, if a major is not hard, then the GPA gets discounted a little bit. Or rather, I should rephrase that. If a major is hard, <clears throat> the GPA gets inflated. So if you're taking, you know, a hard engineering class or, you know, you're taking, you know, biostatistics or something like that, um, you'll get a little bit more credit versus someone who has sociology. But that said, if you do well, a high GPA is a high GPA because I don't know what you otherwise would have done. You know, you you study sociology or psychology, and you get a 395. That's a 395. I'm not gonna discount it because for all I know, you could study mechanical engineering and get a 395. Um, so it doesn't hurt you at all. But you do wanna get a good GMAT score. If you don't have a lot of quant on your academic background, from a uh, you know transcript standpoint, then you do want to get a good test score to try to show those abilities. I have to apply for scholarships for my master's in engineering management. Could I get some guidance on building my profile for the scholarship? Uh, yeah, so feel free to reach out. Just send an email, scott at scott at personalmbacoach.com and um, happy to, to help you. I'm seven years post undergrad. Attended an HBCU, work in sales for a big pharmaceutical company, studying for the Jerry since I'm interested in JD MBA Wharton. Yep, we do a lot of JD MBA. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Do a lot of JD MBA applications. Have a Yale Law grad on our team that helps with that. My thoughts. My thoughts are that sounds like an interesting, interesting profile, interesting opportunity. I'd love to see more. So send across the resume and happy to give you more specific feedback. But it certainly sounds like you could be could potentially be a competitive applicant. I would just need to know a little bit more information. Um, okay. Uh, that question, I don't understand the wording of that one, so I'm gonna skip that one. Um, if I didn't answer your question, feel free to send me an email. Um, there's one question that the language isn't quite clear. So I will skip that one. Um, okay. So 
if you're at a decent paying job, does this affect your chance of getting a scholarship? It does not. No. Merit-based scholarships are merit-based. So it has nothing to do with your income at all. Okay, that was another repeat because I guess I missed it before. Schools have a preference for the GMAT or GRE. They don't. They don't. Um, the GMAT is harder for quant. So if you want to show your strongest abilities from an analytical standpoint, we always recommend the GMAT. You know, GMAT was designed for business schools. So I, you know, I'd probably recommend that. Schools don't have a preference necessarily, but you can showcase stronger performance if you do take the GMAT. What do you think of EMBA admissions for Columbia? August admissions, do you expect more applications due to COVID-19? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, you know, we're, we're, we're doing a lot of EMBA apps now, get a ton of people into Columbia each year. I think I, I'll see a little bit of a, of a jump. I don't think the jump will be as much as for the full time though. Thank you, yep, thank you, Zen. HPS really focused on looking for high leadership candidate. Yes, they definitely do. And you know, for, for this, it's important to show how you were a leader and what things you're doing to become a better leader today and what you want to do going forward to become a better leader. Um, do recommendation letters make a big difference? Well, you know, I wouldn't say a huge difference, but what happens is you're telling schools everything about you. This is the one chance for someone else to give an unbiased opinion of you. So it's really nice to hear it from, from someone else. Otherwise, you could write anything you want in your own, your own essays. Um, Jorge, can we send this? What, yes, we will. We will uh, send the webinar out. We will definitely send it. Um, okay, Kush, yep, thank you. Look forward to connecting with you as well, absolutely. Okay, let's see. A lot of questions. Um, have you received applications from an Indian engineer in an IT industry? Absolutely, tons of them. They get through colleges. Yep. Yeah. So we work with a lot of Indian male engineers. I just talked with two today in India. Um, <clears throat> every situation is different, but we absolutely get lots of them. Probably could have had us uh, an example on, on this webinar as well. Um, how do we differentiate? It really comes down to the extracurriculars and the personal story because at work, you're really not doing that much to, to differentiate, let's say. Okay, let's see. Do you have the same service for people getting, for helping people get scholarships, but for undergraduate programs, ask for a friend? Um, yeah, feel free to reach out. We have a former UPenn admissions director that uh, we work with for the undergraduate. Differences between a master's in management and an MBA. So, Stephanie, it looks like you might have left the room by now, so you know you can feel free to, to well, if you are listening to this recording later, you can feel free to reach out. Um, masters are just a little bit more specialized, and you know an MBA is a bit more of a general degree. It's, it's a higher level degree. It's a little bit more, um, it's a little bit more prestigious, let's say. But a masters, a specialized masters, is more specialized in that particular function. Does a candidate with four or five years experience require recommendation from undergrad? No, no, do not have undergraduate recommendations. If you have a professor write a rec letter, uh, don't have them. Uh, you really want someone from work to write your, your rec letter. That is all the questions. Oh, one more. Um, yes, your friend can definitely send an email. Uh, yes, feel free to have your friend send an email, just scott at personalmbacoach.com. Happy to go into more, more detail. So everyone, thank you so much for logging on. If you're in the East Coast, it's getting late. If you're in India, you woke up early. If you're in California, go have dinner. If you're in Europe, go to bed. Why are you awake? Uh, so thank you everyone for logging on. It was such a pleasure to meet all of you virtually and to chat, feel free to look out for other MBA tour events. We will be doing virtual events. We'll be doing webinars. We'll do another webinar next month. We will do uh, MBA tour events with the MBA tour once they come in uh, the summer. Look out for that. I'll let the MBA tour tell you a little bit more um, about that, but uh, really appreciate you logging on. This is a ton of fun. 
And again, my email address is scott, S-C-O-T-T, at personalmbacoach.com. Website is www.personalmbacoach.com. Have a great rest of the week. Stay safe. Stay inside. Don't shake hands. And uh, let's try to get through everything. Thank you, everyone.